Here it goes. Starting. Okie doke. Now, there, I have some really favorite words in Greek, and this is one of my favorite words. This is a really interesting word. Um, let's see. K A T E S K E. What is it? Did, that, did I spell it wrong? No? E? It's E U. That's E U A S T H E. But the thing that's really interesting is okay, this is kata, right? Kata is down. That's the prepositional that means down. It's really an interesting construct. But this is the word of great interest to me. It should be to you. This word is used a lot in the New Testament. This right here. And the word, the basis of the word, let's see, is... Uh, i got to dig it out of my thing. Skuos. S-K-E-U-O-S. Skuos. And what's really neat about this word, now, uh, they usually translate this word as a vessel, an implement, equipment, or apparatus. But this is not, this is not what this word specifically means. In a context of a, um, in the context of, if I put this specifically in the context of work, period, okay, then this word, okay, when is, what is the context, if I put this in the context of nothing, of just, if I just have this word skuios, skuios in the Greek implies a wife, it implies a wife, the reason is because it, it has multiple meanings that you can almost guess, I think you can guess it. But skuios, in the, the context of the Greek, and that we've lost this context, I think, completely with, uh, in our society. In the Greek, and I, I believe in the ancient world, but we know more about the Greek than the rest. But in the ancient world, a wife was considered, and I don't mean this to say it sound in a negative, not, it's not a negative sense. She was considered a required vocational piece of equipment or implement or apparatus for that man. So if you were a, a fisher man, remember I told you before, a deaconess means the wife of a deacon. A fisherman S in Greek means the wife of a fisherman. A fisherman without his nets is what? Unemployed, right? <laughs> the same view was held of a woman who was the wife of a fisherman. Without the wife, a fisherman would be considered unable to complete his work, not just as a fisherman, but as a man. And the big deal, remember in the Greek, when could you marry? After you completed your military service. Yeah, you were 30 years old when you were a full citizen of Greece, when you were a full citizen of your city-state, not of Greece, of your city-state of Athens, for example, then you were allowed to marry. You couldn't marry before then. So therefore, you were already a man and maybe starting your occupation because the most important occupation to the Athenians was military service, right? That was the most important thing because you don't want to be defeated, right? I mean, life is great until you're defeated, and then what? You're paying Roman taxes or worse, right? You're a slave. How would you like that? How do you like them apples? Okay, so the Athenians took very seriously, probably more seriously than we do, the only other group in the world that really takes this seriously are the Swiss, where every man, woman, and child is a member of their militia and they're all armed. So, so don't try robbing any of their houses because they'll take an FLN out and they'll kill you, you know, and they'll say, sorry, but I was trained. You know, the big deal is that if you want your culture and your society to survive in the ancient world, the military has to be the primary focus, and the Greeks learned that early. So to become a man, to become a citizen, once you were a citizen after military service, then you took up your other profession. And with your other profession, what did you need? In the Greek worldview, they had to have a wife. And this word skuios 
specifically applies when we talk about, let's say, a fisherman's equipment. But naturally within that, at the top of the list, becomes a wife. And it's big, it's huge in the Greek worldview. It is huge in the Greek worldview. In other words, remember when in the New Testament it says that to be a deacon or a, a presbyter or to be right, you have to be the husband of one wife. One wife. They didn't just throw that in because they said the man should be, what, be married. The reason was because in the Greek worldview, without a wife, you were considered an incomplete person and unable to handle what you needed to in the world. So this word kataskuos, down schools, which specifically, if we take it within the context, it means to prepare thoroughly. In other words, to, to, take, to make sure that you have all the equipment, right? So if you're a kataskuos, and, and the word here, that's, that's a, um, what do you call it, a, a, a form, you know, a form of the word itself. But kataskuos means that I am completely ready to do. I have everything that I need. Everything is equipped properly. And so I want you to remember this. Never forget this word schools. This word schools, and we had it in, in first and second Thessalonians. It's in Corinthians. It's kataskuos is kind of new to us. We haven't seen that one. But the big deal is this: this impli the implication whenever you see this word is always a wife. And the first time that the Greeks see this, that's what they think. The second time they see it, or they see it without the context of a worker or the context of preparation, what do they see? Equipment, stuff, right? But within the context of their culture, a woman, a wife, is the is part of that equipment. And, and, it, and I don't think, you know, it is too easy to take this within a demeaning construct, whatever, and I don't think it is at all. It's saying it's a woman or a wife is necessary to, to that cap to the capability of the man. In other words, you can't do it without the wife, period. Which I think is a very interesting implication. And especially as Christians, because remember, the worldview of the Mysterion, the Christian Mysterion, that we are, who's equal? Man, woman, Slave and free. And the implication that people want to say about history is, oh, the women weren't as important, right? I think the exact opposite is true. I think the Greek society in general, and especially Christian society within the Greek, saw women as very critical to the overall society. Even though we see women put, and we do see, you know, we see women putting gynecomes, you know, protected. Well, they're being protected in large measure, right? from other men and predators and other things because they can and they need to. They believe they need to within their society, which if they didn't, they wouldn't have much society. But in any case, just a very important word. Here's an interesting form of something we have already. K-O-S-M-I-K-O-N. Cosmicon. Cosmicon. We know it more as this, right? Cosmicon. It comes from cosmos. Cosmicon, though, specifically means, okay, cosmos means an orderly arrangement. Okay? Cosmos literally means an, an orderly arrangement. Um, and cosmicon, is that the verb form? Uh, is an adverbial form of this. So when we see the cosmicon, right, it's going to be an adverb or an adjective to another word. But if you remember that cosmos, the cosmos means, a, means literally the orderly arrangement in Greek. But it applies to remember our pictures. Here's God, Theos. And Theos created the cosmos, the orderly arrangement, right? And I thought it was really neat because we did the Nicene Creed this morning. And the Nicene Creed says to God who cre the created all things visible 
and invisible, right? And remember, we taught the Greeks were good at, well into this because the Greek worldview, here's the cosmos and here's philosophia. Outside of philosophy is the things that man can't know. Can't know. Philosophy is the things that you can know. And here's the stuff that is gay, basically the world, right? The world are the things that you can see, touch, perceive. The things that are in philosophia outside of gay are things that you can understand and grasp, but you can't necessarily perceive, see, or touch, right? <coughs> Anybody ever touch mathematics? Ever touch logic? Yeah, there it is. I got it. Oh! Right? No, you can't touch any of them. Anyone ever touched love? In the context of Hollywood, yeah, I guess love is sex. But no, love in the context of, of real understanding is an untouchable to emotion. You can't touch emotions. You can't really perceive emotions. You can feel emotions. Now think about that. You know there's a difference, right? I can perceive this table. Feelings, though... Feelings, nothing more than feelings. <laughs> my feelings, you could, you could, you, if you said something bad to me, you might make me feel bad. If you curse me in French, maybe not, because I don't even understand what you're saying, right? Remember, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Guess what? Words won't hurt you unless they cause bad feelings. So if I curse at you in Russian, I can curse at you in Russian all day. Do you care? You might even laugh along with me, right? <laughs> but if I say something mean to you in English, oh, you'll feel bad. Perceptions and feelings, different things. Greeks understood this. For some reason, we can't even teach this in our schools. People don't understand this. But anyway, so the important words today, we'll see these words used within the context. And guess where we're starting today in chapter 9. Now, remember our... Uh, uh, I don't want you to call them wise. Uh, our, we were helped, right? We started out with how many chapters? How many chapters are originally in Hebrews? One. One. Yeah, the whole thing's one chapter. Hey, that was a good answer. That's funny. That how many verses? One. 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 Yeah. You know how many sentences? One. You know. How many words? I like that one. one, right? Because they never put any spaces between them until learn. You know, I gotta say this. You know, all of our books are training texts. Did you know that? Because the Greeks started putting spaces in the words. I think it was around 300 A.D. Two or two or three hundred A.D. They started putting training spaces into the books to help those who were learning to read. That's when we first start to see spaces in words, between the words, is because we want to help those that are learning to read. So all of our books, everything I've written here, is all training materials. Of course, we learn it, you know, grammar and punctuation. These seem like they're a good thing, right, I think. Anyway, right? So, first of all, I'm going to start with 13. 13 is the last verse in 18. And the reason I want to say it is because... I'm going to do two things. Number one, I'm going to give you, I, we went through the, the Greek in that, right? But I want to go, um, maybe we didn't go through the Greek, but I need to. Okay, this is my translation of that Greek. Of, uh, I'll read it in 13 in the NIV. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and, that, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. We were talking about this at the end of class. This is a translation. He argued new, there's, covenant is not in this, not in this uh, verse, in this statement. He argued new, and that he declared obsolete the foremost, but that he declared obsolete and biologically aged near disappeared. And remember, that was kind of a complicated thing, and I tried to explain it. This is what I, this is the paraphrase of what this means. Although the first was near, it disappeared. 
although the first was near, it disappeared. Remember what we were talking about last week? We said, what was the message of John the Baptist? The kingdom of heaven, repent, because the kingdom of heaven, we like to say near, but the word is aegis. Literally, actually it's, the kingdom of heaven literally is here, is what it's saying in the Greek. It's becoming, it's so close, you can grab it to throttle it. That's what aegis means in Greek. That's the same words used in Hebrews, aegis. It's close enough to throttle. If it's close enough to throttle, it ain't near, it's... It's here. And when Jesus Christ, what was his message? Repent because the kingdom of heaven is here. The point is this. Look at what it says right here at the end of Hebrews, of Hebrews 8. Although the first was near or here, it disappeared. Why did it disappear? The author is going to tell us. Because as we know, when they threw the chapters in, they may be right, they may be wrong. It's your choice to decide whether they were or not. And you can actually do that yourself. But the big deal is they believed that at each chapter there was a change of, I won't say logos. They understood this. Remember this logos to tell us thing that we always talk about? Logos to tell us. You know, can we get away from this telos thing that the Greeks have? Can we get away from the logos? Every time we, every time we hear it, it's always logos this and logos that and logos the other thing. And they're always talking about the telos. Now, we're going to see more of this telos today even. But the big deal is the Greek scholars, and I hope modern translators and scholars, understand this, that Greek is always a logos to telos. So when they broke the chapters up, what do you think they were trying to do? Give us the breaks, breaks in the Logos to tell us. Guess what? Is there a break in the Logos to tell us? No. There never will be a break in the Logos to tell us. The best we can have, and I've showed you this, okay? In any document, you're going to have a Logos to tell us through the whole thing. So the whole thing is a, log a Logos, right? And then you're going to have some telos that's unstated at the end. But in the, on the way, I could have all kinds of logos to teloses like this, parallel to the main stream, not conflicting with, but supporting the other logos, right? That's the point. There is an overall logos to telos in every one of these documents, but there are supporting streams, supporting Logos to tell us as they go along. So our, our, our translators, our, our wise men in the past, you know, who gave us the chapters and whatever, tried to do that. Now, I'm not sure they were so successful about versification, but at least that's what they tried to do with the chapters. So theoretically, in a... And by the way, the other problem with these guys is, uh, who were they mostly? Especially giving us chapters. Monks, scribes, and monks, is that what you're... Yeah, you're kind of. What, what? okay, we have the Greeks. The Greeks started out, right? And it, But really, we have the Romans, and the Greeks speak... Greek and the Romans speak Latin. And the Romans speak Latin. And the Latin, remember Latin is... So Greek to Latin is where you're losing... The Greek is logos to telos... But the Roman is intro, body, conclusion, just like us. And guess where you have your problem? And guess who put it, the chapters in? Remember Aesop's Fables? I, I love this example. Aesop's Fables is my favorite. You know, there are no morals in Aesop's Fables in the original. The Romans added him in, so you wouldn't miss him. The Greeks said it's a logos to tell us. If you don't get it, you're <laughs> dumb. Yes, you're not all there. You're like when Paul said to the Galatians, you stupid Galatians. He did. 
In Greek, he goes, you stupid Galatians, they didn't get the telos, right? That's his point. The Romans said, well, we're going to make sure you get them. So they put them in. That's why when you read a lot of Aesop's fables, and you get to the moral, and you go, huh? Because they obviously didn't get it. So I think it's really funny. You know, our Roman brethren have provided us a lot of goodness, but some of the goodness ain't exactly all there. So when we go back and look at the Greek in the original form, now we're pulling the goodness out of it that unfortunately, you know, it's not translations of translations of translations, but we've gained a lot of baggage over the years, right? That's why certain words are translated the way they are. And let's look at this. Okay, chapter 9. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. This is 9.1. Here's the translation. Un, accordingly, properly. It's very interesting. The first thing is un, men, un, men. Accordingly, properly, the protos covenant is added. It does not say covenant. It says the foremost, the protos, the foremost. To hold ordinances, and the word is also, or kai, and ordinances, diakeomai, an equitable deed. Diakeomai. Uh, you can figure this word out. Diakeomai. Dika. Right? Justice. Diakasune, uh, right? Balance. Justice. Um, an equitable deed of Lateria. Uh, Lat L A T R E I A. Lateria. What is significant about Lateria? Do you remember? This word means public service. Here it's, it's translated administration or God, but Lateria is the word for, it's not divine service, Lateria is what you do as an official, a, a Roman official. It's public service. Wow, interesting. Because remember, we've seen this word before. In, in Greek, we would say di uh, uh, diakonos, right? A diakonos is a minister in Greek. But instead of seeing diakonos, we see this word, lateria, as a noun applied to a person. In other words, a worker, a minister. That's, that's Roman. That's Latin. That's not Greek. It's very interesting. Um, te, also. Um, and it's not a, it's the cosmos, uh, cosmos sanctuary, the hagion. So, I know this is a little complicated. Here's what it says. Here's a translation, a literal translation. Accordingly, properly, the foremost held an equitable deed ministration, also the cosmos sacred place. Accordingly, properly, the foremost held an equitable deed ministration also the cosmos sacred place. Now, I don't know about you, but that's way different than now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. Right. They don't fit. What this is talking about, and by the way, if you notice, the previous, the previous thing we were talking about was all about the, the covenants, and the covenants, although sometimes listed, sometimes not, the focus was this concept of covenants, right? But suddenly we have a new expression that isn't just talking about covenants. It's talking about a sacred place. Now, what would be, just for argument's sake, what would be the sacred place of the cosmos? On earth? Oh, no. Kingdom of heaven? Yeah. The kingdom of heaven. And remember the very beginning of Hebrews? 
They talked about the, they made expression about us being in the temple of the kingdom of heaven, right? God's temple. Not the earthly temple, but God's temple, right? Being residents of God's temple. It's really interesting because it's not, although it's going to turn into that construct, there's a huge part of Hebrews that talks significantly about the things on earth are what of those in heaven? Shadows. Sha yeah, shadows. Perfect. That's the word in Greek. That the, that the things on earth are shadows of those things in heaven. We had that originally in Hebrews. Now it's getting within the context of the argument. The development of this argument about these shadowed shadows of things. Now the other thing I want to note is the word cosmos here is cosmikos. What I also want you to note is it is translated, cosmikos is translated in, the, in both the NIV and in the um, King James as worldly. If I wanted to express worldly or earthly, what word would I use in Greek? Gay. Gay. Big time. If I want to express the creation of God, I always use the word cosmos. It's very interesting to me that they took cosmicon, cosmicon, which is an adverb to describe the, the hagion, right? And they, they turned it into the opposite, kind of. That's why I worry about our translators. I really worry. We're probably going to get more worried about them a little bit. But let's just focus, okay, this first verse said, it's not saying anything about the first covenant. It's saying the foremost, the foremost, whatever the foremost is. We can assume the foremost is that, um, what's the word I want? Uh, not, it's the disposition, right? The, the uh, disposition, not deposition, the disposition, the, the alignment of things, right? You can assume that, that's cool. But this isn't talking at first about the places on earth. They're talking about the places in heaven. And look at the second verse, verse 2. Here's the NIV. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Remember the first one. first one, in, in a little translation, according to property, the foremost held... And in equal deed ministration, also the cosmos sacred place. Verse 2 says, here's the Greek. Gar, assigning a reason, there was, and the word is not there was. The word is kata koizazo. There was, it's not there was, assigning a reason, catechism, so literally, okay, if you want, to prepare thoroughly, but specifically down a vessel with an implication of man, wife, and everything prepared. In other words, everything, assigning a reason, everything was prepared. What was prepared? Just a guess. Everything was prepared. What was prepared? What was prepared? They had a, a man, a woman, and everything they needed to live. The garden. Yeah, the Garden of Eden. Yeah, right? That's why the author used this word. This, he didn't have to use this word, right? The authors could have used, there's a lot of words they could have used in Greek. But they, he used this word. In other words, implying not just the stuff. You know? And of course, our translators translate it as there was. Okay. Well, all right. But, Gar, assigning a reason, prepared thoroughly. In other words, all the implements and man and woman. A Skene, a, a tent or cloth hut, a tabernacle, you could say tabernacle. Made is added. There's no made. The protos, the foremost, 
wherein host is added, uh, wherein, where within was is added, the candlestick, the lucina, the lampstand, and the trap, uh, trapeza, a four-legged table or stool for food, and the showbread, literally the, the prothesis, uh, the set before raised loaf of bread, the prothesis artos, the set before raised, raised loaf of bread, which, in other words, which sum is legoed, legoed, the is added, the hegion. Now notice, it didn't say cosmicon hegion, it said the hegion. So the first verse is talking about the, the re, things in heaven. The second verse is talking about those things that are reflected on the earth. And so the, here's, a tr, here's a literal translation. I know these literal translations are kind of difficult, but I'll try to, I'm trying to put it together for you. Assigning a reason prepared thoroughly down a vessel, literally an implication of a wife. A tent or cloth hut. The foremost therein, the lampstand, the four-legged table or stool for food, and the set before a raised loaf of bread, which some is argued a sacred thing. Which some is argued a sacred thing. In other words, where is the real stuff? And where is the reflection of it? And what is the reflection of it? It's not just, it's not just the stuff in the Hagion. It's all the usins and usins, right? It's men and women and all the implements of life in the gay. But within the gay, what did God... Okay. It's saying that all this is a reflection of those things in heaven, which we as... Okay. Right? We got our sarks, Tuke, and Penuma. Okay, if we're going to go in Greek or English, all right, in our viewpoint, which is invisible? And suke. They're both invisible, right? <laughs> They're invisible stuff. What are they? What are they? Our sarks is what? <laughs> it's a reflection of what? The real. What's the real you? The real you is your, your Tsuke and Panuma, which is in the cosmos. Your Sarks is simply a reflection of that reality, right? And which is most real. Well, what's going to last? I mean, this is pure Greek philosophy, right? The, he, the, the Christians, teen hodos, look, people want to say they're unsophisticated. This is pretty sophisticated stuff when you think about it, right? It's pretty deep things. Let's go on. Okay, so that's two. Let's look at three. This is, this is what it says. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place. Now, the author is describing... <clears throat> The temple, right? So I have I have the Holy of Holies. Where's the lampstand? Here. Where's the showbread? Here. Right? It's in the holy place. It's in the holy place, but not the Holy of Holies. Right? These are all reflections, though, of the reality in the cosmos. So let's see. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place. And here's what it says in the Greek. But it's not and, it's but. Meta, amid the dutros, the second katapetsama. We've had this word before. Kata, kata, pet, asma. Kata, pet, asma. This is the fly down. Remember where we had this word before? Yeah. Remember Mark? Yeah. Remember Mark where the, what, what, what got ripped into? The fly down. Right? And we had this before in Hebrews because they used this word when it was describing the curtain in the temple. 
So, behind the fly down, the uh, let's see, behind the the uh, the second the second veil, and where's the first veil? Now this is interesting. Yeah, I would say that it's probably the heavens, but there is supposed to be, there isn't really a curtain here, but there is some kind of, we don't know what it is. It's not really described well, right, in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. But there is something separating the holy place from the most holy, right? But the most holy is where this fly down is supposed to be, the second. But you notice it calls it the second veil. So what is the first veil? I have not seen this used before in the New Testament. I'm going to say that they're using both figurative language and they're using direct language. So directly it could be this, this covering, but indirectly based on the first statement in this chapter, it could literally be the separation from the heavens, right? And we call that, what do we call that in English? The veil of tears. <laughs> veil of death or life, right? Veil of life. Because when you die, right, the veil of life, the you are when you're dead, then the veil is lifted. We use this language in English all the time. I think it's very interesting. Um, we know that the Greeks did not use the Greeks are very um, concrete, right? So it could apply directly to a to this, but the Hebrews are very euphemistic. So within the context of the writers, since it's written to the Hebrews, I think we could use either form. And I think it's very interesting, especially since they're using such, um, they're trying very hard to build concrete terms and logical, logical reasoning. But this sounds a lot like some of the Socratean stuff that you'll find in Socrates' um, Crito. It's in, right in the Crito. <coughs> Here's, let's see, finish this up. Um, fly down. The D is added. Uh, Skene tent, tabernacle, which is legoed, which is legoed, the holiest of all. The holiest of all, the hagion. Here's a, here's a literal translation. But amid the second flydown of the tent, that is argued to be the awful place from which the hagios penuma proceeds. I wanted to add that in because that's the big deal, right? We know this. We've heard this in Hebrews. The Haggis Penuma proceeds from the breath of God proceeds. Matter of fact, the Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew proceeds from the Holy of Holies. And you remember in Mark, I told you, it wasn't necessarily that God opened the veil. The picture we have in Mark was that the Haggis Penuma ripped it as it came out. So the Spirit of God came out of the Holy of Holies. And guess what? What's now in the world? By our, this is theological. No, that's a theological thought. But what's in the world? The Agnes Penuma, right? The, the Holy Spirit is in the world because it was released from the Holy of Holies. The assumption was, and we saw this in Hebrews too, the assumption was that before Christ, it was it resided in the Holy of Holies, right? And then, well, anyway, that's true. So, well, the Bible does say that we're, temp we're temples of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, it's in us and out in the world. Out in the world. I, I just, and I agree with you. I think this is a beautiful picture, though, don't you? Especially when you look at Mark and you look at early Hebrews. We saw it in the early part of Hebrews where it talked about just this point. So if you look at Mark and you say, the Holy Spirit, the Haggis Penuma, literally burst out of the Holy of Holies when Christ died, right? Literally burst out. Even though God was dead, the Holy of Holies burst out and now can reside in every, not non-Christian or other, but into every Christian person. Right? Yes, sir. In the creed that we profess today, uh -huh. said that the Holy Spirit spoke through the prophets. So was the Holy Spirit here before he burst out? This is really an interesting question. And because I, um, apparently, in the Old Testament, and this is the Old Testament, remember the, well, you weren't here, 
But the verse we had in uh, Je uh, Jeremiah pointed this out, that, you know, um, you won't, uh, I'll paraphrase, but it says basically, you won't need to teach your neighbor anymore about God or about, you know, the words of God because they will reside in them, implying that the Holy Spirit would instruct and tell them, right? That's what we just read in the previous chapter in 8. And so within that extension, apparently, and we see this, look in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was granted to go on to or come into people, prophets and others, at specific points and times. So, for example, Saul was taken over by the Holy Spirit, and David was too. And at different times, different prophets. And then, were they, then was he called back? Apparently he was, because the implication was when the Holy Spirit was on you, you, would, you were pro prophesying, or you would, you would have this, these powers that were unusual, right? And so it says in the Old Testament that in the, in the age of the Messiah, right? What does it say in the age of the Messiah? The Holy, your, your sons and daughters... And, and your daughters, sons and daughters will pro prophesy, right? Yeah, the assumption is that when the Holy Spirit comes upon all of God's people, it, it won't be an exclusive thing. It won't be God saying, hey, you got it. You're my prophet today, right? It's that the whole of the people will get it. And so the picture that we have here, um, <laughs> maybe it's hard for us to believe, but we can see, you know, for example, in the... What's the group, you know, the, the, those who speak, the tongue speakers and the, the uh, pew runners? What's that? Charismatic. The charismatic movement, right? I, I think they misinterpret. I think it's a little bit different. But the whole point of this Holy Spirit, Pneuma, being able to reside in people, remember, will allow you to control your suke. The suke allows you. And so the theory is that in, in this era of non, we're not fated in this era, right? that in this messianic era, that we can control our thoughts, control our being. That doesn't mean that people won't sin. It just means that we have more power to do God's will, to hit the mark, right? I think this is beautiful. The imagery is really cool. Do you have another question or, or comment? Oh. Anyway, so amid the, um, but this is what it says, but amid the second fly down of the tent, it is argued to be the awful place from which the Hagios Pneuma proceeds. What's interesting about this is it says amid, right? The, our translator says um, behind. Behind. Okay. If I say behind, what does that presume? Well, I, I'm, I'm not there. But if I say amid, what does that presume? You're there, right? You're in it. Um, and I think what's really cool, again, uh, let's see, what is this, does this have this word? Uh, anyway, um, let's go to four. This is a continuation. Um, which had the holy altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant? This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff, that had budded and some tablets, stone tablets of the covenant. That's what it says in the Greek. Which is added? Which hold, echo, hold, the is added? Cherusos, made of gold, censer, uh, uh, thumeriation, the, the place of fumigation, the center. Okay, literally, thumeaterion thumi means ascent of the sacrifice, okay? So it held the censer, censer of the sacrifice, and the kibitos, the box of the covenant, of diatheke, the disposition, overlaid parakalufoto, covered all over round about, uh, panothean. It's really interesting because the word in Greek is parakalupto, pan. Panto thin, literally covered all over, roundabout from all sides. Where in our English we say overlaid, I mean that's okay, but it's really funny that the Greek is so specific about this that it was covered all over, roundabout from all sides. 
with Jerusalem, with gold, with a gold article, wherein, uh, literally, hos, in hos, was is added, the is added, cherusos, made of gold, pot, stam, stamnos, a jar, that had, that held to hold mana, and Aaron's, uh, literally, Aaron's rabdos, a stick, that, it's ho, that germinated, and the tables, literally plaques, a molding board of the covenant of the diatheke, a deposition, a disposition, a disposition. So, here's the literal translation. Held golden place of fumigation, so it was sent to the sacrifice, and the box of the covenant covered all over from all sides a gold article, wherein a golden jar held manna, an Aaron stick that budded, and the molding board of the covenant. <laughs> now, this is really interesting. Molding board of the covenant. Molding board of the covenant. You remember when Moses went up there? Now, there's a couple of interesting theories, but our view in the Hebrew is very euphemistic. If, if when Moses came out of Egypt, he knew what kind of writing? Hieroglyphics. hieroglyphics. And hieroglyphics are written in stone. But they were going to a place, and they were going in the direction of the place, where what did they put, what did they do with tablets? Do you ever hear of Egyptian tablets? Never heard of Egyptian tablets. But we've heard of other kinds of tablets. What kind of tablets have you heard of? Clay, cuneiform clay tablets. Cuneiform tablets. So they were going from a place that did stone writing with hieroglyphics to a place that did mostly cuneiform. As a matter of fact, the proto, two proto-languages came out of the early period in, this, in the world. And the two proto-languages, one was based in hieroglyphics and the other one was based in cuneiform. It's very interesting, the Greek calls it a molding board. Because with a molding board, I get the impression of cuneiform. And what's really funny is, if you, you ever looked at the... Okay, what does Hebrew writing look like? kind of pictographs, but it looks more like cuneiform than it does hieroglyphics, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It looks more like something that I would make using, well, especially a brush, but make using, like, you know, a, a, a marker in, a, in, in clay. As a matter of fact, some have proposed, and I mentioned this in early, way earlier classes years ago, but, you know, we, there are scholars who believe that the Hebraic writing started as... Um, the Seratic, or it started as hieroglyphics, or the Seratic script of the of the Egyptians, and when they got to the Promised Land, they didn't have papyrus, they didn't really have stone, they had cuneiform. So what they did is they adapted the forms of the hieroglyphics in the Seratic script into cuneiform type stuff that they could write, and so. That's why their script is much different than the cuneiform and much different than the hieroglyphics form. And then we see later on, what did they do? They, they modified that to vellum and papyrus, right? So we see that vellum and papyrus from the script. But if you notice, they didn't have vowels. They, did, they followed a lot of the <coughs> Egyptian forms in their writing. So I think it's very interesting, but... The thing that we see here specifically is, okay, we've got a description. We have had a description. First, it says, here are the, here are the things of, like, the heavens. And then they're reflected in the things of the earth. And it's been describing, it specifically described the holy place, and now it described the holy of holies and the stuff in the holy of holies. So let's go to five. Seems kind of simple here. 
Five, above the ark were the cherubim of the glory overshadowing the atonement cover, but we cannot discuss these things in detail now. Kind of have. Here's what it says in the Greek. De, but, but, huper ano, above, upward, altos, it, the is added, cherubims, literally cherubim, it's, uh, it's taken from the Hebrew, of doxa, of doxa, kata skiezo, to downshadow, literally to overshade the hilastron, the hilastron, um, an expiatory. Halastron is, let's see, um, <laughs> they translate it mercy seat. Uh, Halastron literally means a seat of, of glory or a seat of, of uh, you know, for a king or a place. Of, literally, peri, through, all over, which, hos, um, we cannot, literally, nun, we cannot, nun, logos. Meros, a division or share. Okay, this is kind of interesting. But above upwards, it cherubims of glory overshade the halastron, all over which we cannot now argue a share. It does not say, as we have translated, but we cannot discuss these things in detail now. That's not what it says at all. It says specifically, over which we cannot now argue a share. This is a huge clue. Why can't they argue a share? You can take this a zillion different ways, actually. But, but specifically, why can't... All right, let's put it this way. Can any of you argue a share of the Holy of Holies or the Holy Place? Why? You're, yeah, you're Gentiles. Well, I'm a Gentile. We're all Gentiles together, right? We're Gentiles. We can't argue a share. We have no share in which covenant? The Mosaic. the Mosaic covenant, the first covenant, the foremost covenant, right? We aren't in that disposition. To get in that disposition, you would have to go through the whole process, right, of becoming a Jewish person and being accepted in circumcision for men, etc., etc., we can't argue a share, which right now would tell you the authors are saying what? They are? Gentiles. They're Gentiles. It also tells you that they are writing to Gentiles. Gentiles. It doesn't necessarily exclude, um, it doesn't necessarily exclude Jews from their audience. You see what I'm saying? But the assumption here, and remember I drew the picture, Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, Jews, King Honos. You see more Gentiles in that list than you do Jews. The other thing... Let me leave you with this. I also mentioned the we. This is the more, they've used the we now at least three times, but it says we cannot now argue a share, which would automatically point to how many authors? More than one. More than one. <laughs> so I, I think both we are getting some cool clues about Hebrews, which is really neat, but Think about this reflective concept, because we're going to get more into it. The authors are obviously setting us up, right, for a logos of some importance. Thank you, Father, for the word. We pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.